Are you introduced me to Buzu? And the whole Sparta family. RIP my family. I'm having a friend. Anyway, you get the drift. You get the drift. That's the same you've been asking right now. Regular with the kind of friend on target practice. How to see my dad. The, the tune, the heartless killers. Dance that has become the soundtrack. The murder, death, and destruction in Iron Man. It used to be the soundtrack for something of substance and value. Now it is the soundtrack to death and destruction. This is dead by the election day. Kind of pattern. Feel more big than ever. See me jumping me dead. Big barrier that one and all kind of things. Pay attention to who them black people. The Jamaican people have made their choice. Who do you want? Give us the 87. Give us the Dan, give us the 90. Give us the gunman. Criminal culture. This is why even the U2 work in Alaska and Grace Kennedy. As him don't work, right, him switch back into him a fake bad boy image. And this is why the same girl who worked in Alaska and Grace Kennedy we tell her say a gunman she want him to hold. 87 alone makes you drop panty. Seems sincere that and said, you can't, you can't look a joke. Joke, the joke is on you, Sim. Ten years from now, you'll be cleaning up the damage for the 87 to tour. The joke is on you. The Jamaican masses are not victims. They are complicit. They made their choice. Give us the 87. Who no want to spare? Who no want to live? Give us Tesha. Give us sci-fi. One thing I'm most grateful for, I've never had to rely on the crowd. Because when you become a prisoner of the crowd, that's how you end up. I say, if you will, give us the 87. Many of you know that it's a madness, you know. You know, so this is acidic, but you're weak. So when you stand there and you hear people say, You must the dog, and 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 the matter about either Tisha, the matter about the favorite artist, and the matter about King, and the matter about them, you know, you know who these people are with them, going, but you're weak because you're trying to fit in. And people who fit in get lost in the pages of time. Only those who draw a hard line. And say, I'm not following. I guess the thing, man. History has proven that those people get rejected in the moment, but history remembers them well. Every single hero you celebrate was considered a weirdo, an outlier, a chat too much at the time. After them dead and gone, people look back and say, You know, celebrity is right. Remember that one who said, oh, Marcus Garvey. Almost every Jamaican quote-unquote hero was trampled upon by the people in that choice. But you end up, your father ended up passing when you were two years old. Yes. So you never really got a chance to, to really know him like that. Yeah. What was it like, you know, before you started getting into music, when you were five years old, ten years old, and you're growing up in this family, because your father had 11 children. Were you guys all close in the beginning? As far as I can remember, yeah. you know what I mean? We've always been close. Um, you know, my older brothers and sisters always um, check for me. You know? <laughs> as, a little youth, as a little baby, they would always still come pick me up. And we would always, you know, holidays, we would go spend time. And, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And even our mothers were very supportive of that, of us coming together as children. You know what I mean? So as far back as I can remember, yeah. Okay. And you're the youngest child? Youngest son. So there's a daughter yeah. that's younger than you. Yeah. Okay. So you're growing up in this environment. At what point did you think, okay, I want to I wanna start doing some music myself? It was always there. I mean, as a, you know, I mean, you know as, a, as a very young child, I can remember having to perform my father's song. I used to put on um, vinyl. I used to have a little Fisher-Price turntable. Okay. And I would put on his songs and 
pretend to be on stage and that was like a nightly ritual before going to bed so it was always something that was there in my life and you know we, st we started doing shows in my aunt's living room and then my aunt you know um Danacor, she she was the one who really said you know let's try to do it publicly so we started doing like mother's day events um, you know, little girls, birthday parties, things of this nature, you know, and that was a, a group called the Shepherds. Right, and that was with Freddie McGregor's daughter. Right. And uh, Cat Corp's Cat Corp. daughter from Third World, right. his son. Right, so his mom was the one who put it together. You know, ah, okay, you know, right. So, you know, um, <clears throat> so, so that was, so like again, it, it was always something that was very dear from when I was very young. And then what really happened still now is that, you know, dance and music, a real big influence in me becoming an artist too. Okay. Because um, of course my family's music was always present, but dance and music was the first music I started to buy for myself. Yeah. And going to concerts, I would always have an opportunity to go to concerts as a young child. And you know, I would remember seeing people like Shabaranks and Tiger and Peter Metro and I would say I want to be like that. I want to do what they're doing. Right. As opposed to saying I want to be more doing what my dad is doing, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. But were there, I mean, when you were growing up and you were playing your, your dad's songs, were there specific songs that you really loved? I can't remember what they were when I was that age. There's, right. you know, I can tell you, so for me now, I would say I kind of like, in generally speaking, the more darker sounding stuff. So, so one love might not always be on my playlist, my personal Zimbabwe songs like that. Yeah, and you know, I mean, top ranking and, yeah. you know, yeah, you know. Okay. Were you Junior Gong when you were in the Shepherds, or did that come later? No, that came later. Okay. Yeah. So when did the Junior Gong name come about? It came about really shortly after after we stopped doing the Shepherds, shortly after that because of now becoming basically a solo artist. And again, within the dancehall community, you wouldn't usually use your government name, you know what I mean? So trying to search for an acronym, you know what I mean? Um, and of course, being that gang is my, one of my father's nicknames, you know. Yeah. But there was a little, there was a little event still. There was a, there was a, there was a tribute to my father at Fifty Six Hope Road, the, the Bob Marley Museum, and I was trying to get through the gate. And one of the security guys saw me trying to come through and started to clear the way for me. And he was like, next piece, Gang Juna coming, Gang Juna, Gang Juna. <laughs> so that's kind of when it kind of clicked on me. I said, all right, all right. I've been working with it since that. Yeah. So you were Junior Gang at that point. Yeah. Now, you, you started working on your first album, Mr. Motley. Yeah. Now, what I think got everyone by surprise was that unlike uh, Ziggy, you were more of a DJ style right. artist, which, you know, you could sort of compare it to rapping versus singing in, in a way. Right. Right, where yeah. a DJ in, in, in reggae is the one, the guy on the mic, whereas the selector is the DJ. Right? Exactly, yes. Right. Yes. So, so you came out with more of a new style. Was there a reason why you, you went with that style as opposed to going with, like, the classical singing style that your brother did so well with? Again, just like I was saying before, because I've grown up, with dance and music as my music, you know what I mean? And again, being impressed by my dance hall heroes and wanting to, to do what they were doing. So it was really just more because being a fan of rhyming as opposed to singing, you know? Yeah. But you were singing as well. <laughs> Back then, not really so much. Okay, that came know. later. Yeah. Mr. Molly comes out and it had, had a, a good reception. Yeah. But the second album, Halfway Tree, comes out. And that one's a Grammy. That one's a Grammy, yeah. So your second album that you put out already wins a Grammy. How, how did it feel to win a Grammy that early on in your career? Great. And, and I was growing up against some, uh, well, in particular, Barry Salmon, who is a legend in right. Jamaican music, you know what I mean? So to win a Grammy, you know, being that it was someone else who was up for the Grammy. I was the Marvin Gaye of... Of Jamaican, Jamaican music, yeah. yeah. You know, so... You know, that was a wow for me, you know. That was you know, a great accomplishment. Um, yeah, so I wasn't expecting it. I mean, I, I knew I, I, I stood a great chance, you know what I mean? Yeah. In general, you know. Yeah. Now, now the, whole, the whole concept of the name Halfway Tree. Yeah. Explain that. Well, Halfway Tree is a place in Jamaica. It's, it's kind of like a big roundabout, you know. Um, 
and the reason I named the album Half a Tree because this place is almost like you said in between downtown and uptown. Downtown being, you know, the more you say rougher side of town, and uptown being the more privileged side of town. Yeah. You know what I mean? So because of me myself being like where both of these worlds meet, being where my father is from and where my mother is from, and in the halfway tree, the album halfway tree, you know, as a metaphor for my life. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a theme that you've really carried on through a lot of your music because, you know, like, you you're, you have the, the ghetto youth crew. Yeah. Right? That, that That's your thing. Yeah. And, and you sing about oppression. Yeah. But you yourself grew up in somewhat of a privileged lifestyle. Absolutely. How does that really balance out? Because you don't really see, I mean, when you look at reggae in general, most most of the artists come come from the slums. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, even Bounty Killer, I think, where we're dissing, uh, did he diss certain artists, call them, you know, call them uptown boys and stuff like that at certain points? Perhaps. Yeah. yeah. So, so how does that balance out when you're singing about an oppression that you yourself may not have actually experienced? You know, I, I'm only one generation removed, so I'm, I'm counting my blessings. You know what I mean? Perhaps if it wasn't for music and my father being who he was, I might not exist. You know, who knows? Um, at the same time, you know, if Jamaica is not a huge place, you don't have to really, you know, search far to really know what's going on. And, you know, if you're, if you're someone who check for human beings, then, you know, you'd care for those who need help, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, 